Thanks, Vivek. And thanks to the organizers for having me. Um, today, I want to tell you about uh, uh, work that we're doing on how to take the wealth of connectomic data that's being generated here um, and turn that into models. Um, and so the title is How to Simulate a Connectome. Uh, and in particular, what that means is how do we go from the connectivity, the structural information that we have, to predictions of neural activity, which is about the dynamics uh, of the living brain. Uh, this is work uh, um, uh, spearheaded by Jan Lapalainen, who's a joint PhD student between myself and Jakob Make. So um, just to remind you, you've heard a lot about the fruit fly, but uh, uh, you know, it's, it's this tiny um, insect uh, that has a short lifespan. We know a lot about its brain. Um, we now know that it has about 160,000 uh, neurons. Uh, Philip can tell you exactly uh, the, the, the right number. Um, what you're seeing here is a light microscopic image of the brain at the top and the ventral nerve cord. And the reason why I bring this up is because, you know, if you, um, uh, oh, and, 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 and the other thing that's really awesome is that it's largely conserved across individuals. So, you know, um, uh, someone can measure the connectivity in one animal, the activity in a different animal. Um, and uh, um, do a modeling in a computer, and we can hope that they will all agree, um, which is uh, going to be the enterprise here. Um, here is a slide that Greg Jeffress made, uh, which I really love because it puts together uh, the, the excitement that happened over the summer when um, we now have the connectome uh, for the brain and the nerve cord in two separate uh, individuals. Uh, Gwyneth... Uh, um, uh, it, 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 it was uh, involved and led uh, the, uh, uh, the ventral nerve cord effort, and uh, uh, Philip uh, led the, uh, uh, the, the, the brain um, uh, efforts here. Uh, the thing that I, I want you to take away is this is about 160,000 neurons, and as someone who's been doing deep learning for a while, the, um, the earliest deep learning models, AlexNet, from 2011, has four times as many neurons as this brain. And that model can only do object recognition. This fruit fly can do a lot more than that. It has about 700 pixels in each eye. Um, and uh, it, you know, it, it, it can use that to navigate around the world. Um, as you've heard from multiple people, it can uh, do complex motor control of flying and walking and uh, um, and of course, do vision, um, all in a quarter of the number of neurons as the earliest deep neural networks that we've trained. And of course, the deep neural networks that we train now are uh, many orders of magnitude larger uh, than uh, this model. And so um, the hope as a computational person is, um, you know, maybe this is uh, uh, easier to understand than the large deep neural networks that... Uh, that we currently train. So here's, um, again, as a computational person, my caricature of how the brain works and how the, the, uh, you know, the animal works. Um, there's microscopic phenomena like um, the neural network in the brain, which um, comprises um, you know, the network, how are the neurons connected, um, also the dynamics of the neurons and the synapses that are putting them together, and then a whole bunch of other uh, biophysical phenomena, some of which we know, and some which we probably have yet to discover. And together, these microscopic phenomena give rise to um, the neural activity, which is a collective phenomenon of the network. And the neural activity gives rise to the behavior of the animal. And the behavior serves certain tasks that it's trying to perform. The animal at any given time, it might be you know, looking for a mate or looking for food or trying to uh, escape a predator. Um, and uh, all of this um, is in the service of those tasks. So um, uh, we'd like to understand how this um, emerges uh, and, and model this. Um, what are the data that we can uh, collect? We now have, um, in exquisite detail, the connectivity uh, of this nervous system. Uh, that's a structural measurement. Um, we know something about the types of dynamics um, uh, that could potentially exist um, if you uh, think about the last 50 years of research that people have done. Um, it, it's not something where we know for this neuron, this is the dynamic, 
this synapse, this is the dynamics. We don't know that comprehensively, but we know something about the space of it. And so where we are is the connectome by itself is not sufficient because you know, it tells us a lot. It tells us a lot of detail of the structure, but nothing about the dynamics. Um, and so um, you know, that's the situation that we're in. Um, and so if you think about uh, uh, simulating from the bottom up using these microscopic measurements and asking how well can you predict the macroscopic uh, behavior of the brain and the animal, um, uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, this is not really well posed. Um, uh, different choices of the dynamics uh, could give you different patterns of neural activity, even with the same uh, connectivity. Okay, so, um, well, we know more about the, 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 the animal than uh, just the connectivity. In fact, um, for, uh, for ages, we've been able to measure the behavior. Um, uh, you know, looking at the behavior, we can kind of intuit sometimes what the animal might be trying to do. Um, both Vivek and uh, Larry have talked about, um, you know, what kinds, inferring what kinds of navigation, uh, what the goal might be for an animal at, at different times. Um, so we've been able to do something like that. We can measure neural activity, not everywhere and not um, uh, uh, all the time, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, in some neurons at some times under certain tasks, we can measure the neural activity. And so you can imagine putting these measurements together to constrain a single model. And that's indeed what the community does. Uh, every um, talk that you've heard here so far, where people have uh, modeled a circuit, um, uh, has, has put together some understanding some, um, of uh, you know, what computational task uh, a circuit might be performing, for instance, path integration or, or keeping track of where you are, uh, the, the heading direction, um, uh, and, and combining it with the connectivity to build a model. Um, and the question that I'm asking here is how do we uh, kind of uh, um, systematize that procedure and how can we apply these constraints in a systematic manner and discover the classes of models that are consistent with these constraints? So as we, um, uh, how do we put together different measurements at different scales uh, to build a, 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 a single model? Now, um, uh, so one, uh, there's another family of models that, that are now quite popular, um, uh, and uh, uh, less so in the fruit fly world where we have uh, a lot of connectivity information, but uh, um, in the primate and rodent worlds, um, uh, this uh, is uh, uh, called the new sort of neuro AI uh, family of models, where what you do is you train up an artificial neural network. Now that we have artificial deep neural network uh, models, you can train them to perform the same task or the same behavior that the animal is performing. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and then ask and look at the neural activity of that artificial neural network and say, what can we learn about this, uh, uh, this, this artificial agent that can perform the same task? Um, you know, can that teach us something about the way that the brain uh, might be solving uh, this task? And uh, um, the real answer there is, even though that's, that's been a very successful approach uh, um, in models of uh, 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 the visual system, uh, in the primate uh, visual system, for instance, uh, there's still too many solutions there. And we know this because every time we train a deep neural network the next year, there's a new deep neural network architecture that claims to solve the same task, uh, maybe a little bit better. Um, and so we know that the, the family of models that can solve the same uh, input-output function, the same task, uh, is, is quite large. Um, and so you know, can we get at the mechanism behind neural computation through that approach? Not really. But um, uh, what I want to argue here is that that can be a powerful uh, technique to combine with the data that we now get from the connectome um, to be able to actually get at uh, uh, better mechanistic predictions of how the brain works. Um, and so this work, um, uh, Jana's uh, project, we can think of as a thought experiment. And here the question that we asked was, you know, how far can we get from the connectome measurement alone? The connectome is something we can measure in a dead brain. Neural activity behavior requires a living brain. Let's say we just have data that we get from a dead brain, which is comprehensive in a way that measurements we make from the living brain um, are not. Um, 
But we also know what task, uh, what kind of computation that particular circuit might be performing. How far can we get with that? And uh, so that's kind of a lower bound to how far this approach can go. And of course, as you add in more information about the neural activity or behavior, you can only do better. And so this is uh, a talk about that lower bound. So the idea is um, what we did was we took uh, um, a connectome of the uh, motion pathways of the visual system that was uh, um, uh, measured by my colleagues at Genelia. These connectomic measurements made by electron microscopy, we um, took them to build a connectome for, you know, um, uh, uh, for this uh, system. And this model, the simulation, what we're going to ask is if we showed uh, this, uh, um, this simulation, um, a pattern of visual stimuli, and we asked for each of these neurons, which has a name, um, which, we can, which over the last 20 years uh, people have made uh, detailed uh, recordings of in a living brain, how well do our predictions of the neural activity match the neural activity um, measurements that were made in the lab across 26 studies? So um, uh, that's sort of the, 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 the outline of, of this talk. So um, a little bit about the visual system. The fruit fly has two compound eyes. The compound eyes have photoreceptors that are organized in a perfectly crystalline hexagonal lattice. The very cool thing is that the neural network that processes this visual input also has the same hexagonal crystalline sort of architecture um, in, in the processing. And so what you're seeing over here is the retina, the lattice of the retina, and then um, the several stages of computation that follow it, the lamina, medulla, lobule, and lobule plate, each of which have neurons that appear once per column. These are called columns, which are organized in this hexagonal lattice. And so what that means is that um, we can make a list of all the cell types that are in this uh, um, uh, uh, optic lobe. Um, and these are the columnar cell types. So these are ones that appear once per column or sometimes you know, every other column or so on. And uh, um, these might start with the photoreceptors. There's eight of them. So these are R1 through R8. These names, don't really worry about them. But what I'm showing you is that we know who's connected to who. And this is um, as of uh, um, you know, uh, maybe four or five years ago. And we now have you know, awesome new data, uh, both coming from my colleagues at Genelia uh, and, and, and from, from Cambridge and, and Princeton uh, that now have a map for the entire optic lobe. This is just for the motion pathways. And this is 66, uh, 64 cell types. And uh, what you're seeing here is which of these cell types is connected to which of the other cell types. And uh, these are squares labeled uh, colored and um, blue and red to tell you whether it's excitatory or inhibitory. That's information we also have. And uh, the size tells you how strongly they're connected. So um, in reality, this is uh, one way that you could plot everything. Yes. On the previous slide, is there any, uh, this is the first time trying to see these matrices. Is there any basis to the ordering of these columns? I, it looks like this is alphabetical. Uh, but if you had to use some lineage information or whatever, is there a tree that connects different sorts of these neurons along some kind of dendrogram? Um, so we've roughly ordered them based on these stages, um, retina, lamina, medulla, and so on. Um, there isn't necessarily a, a unique ordering, but uh, you know, there's some rough ordering that you can imagine. Yes, Vlad. So <clears throat> these are numbers for the number of synap synaptic connections between neuron of one type to another type. Can you say something about the variance of, the, of these things? Yeah, so um, it's, it scales roughly with the mean and maybe about 30% from what we, um, from other studies. Um, the variance is probably, uh, yeah, the technical noise might dominate, I think, uh, you know, our, our estimates there. Okay, so um, here's another way that you can plot that connectome, where each of these is uh, uh, hexagons, is one cell type, and each pixel within that hexagon is one cell. And so in reality, all of these photoreceptors, the same pixel 
is co-located um, uh, together. So the, you know, um, uh, so they, they sit together in space, but I've kind of separated them so that each cell type sort of sits together. Um, and similarly, all the other cell types. So each of these hexagons is the entire collection of neurons of a particular cell type. Um, and you know, where they appear once per column, that's what, that's what we're uh, showing. And where they are less than, fewer than that, then that's what we're showing here. And so the lines that connect them correspond to the, uh, the non-zero entries um, uh, in the previous matrix. Um, and what we also know is in that spatial organization, uh, precisely what that connectivity structure looks like. So if I look at two neurons of two different cell types, not only do, they, do we know that they connect to each other, but also the spatial pattern of their connectivity, which for those of you who know about convolutional neural networks, this is exactly like a convolutional filter that maps from uh, pools information from one of the feature maps. So if you think of each of these uh, cell types as a feature map uh, that, 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 that integrates information from uh, one of the feature maps um, uh, into computing the next feature map. What are the numbers on the left? So those numbers there are the average numbers of synapses. Uh, so we, we're, we're building an average model here that's, that's spatially uh, equivariant. OK, so, so now that's the structural data that we have. And what we wanted to do is to um, figure out how to simulate it. So I'll tell you about the dynamics that, that we're going to put on, onto these neurons which are really the simplest that you can do. These neurons are, uh, in the early visual system, do not spike. So we treat them as passive um, uh, point neurons. So um, they're also quite small. Um, so we'll treat them as, as passive point neurons. Uh, so each neuron has two parameters. It has a time constant, and it has a resting membrane potential. Uh, these are dynamical parameters. We don't have measurements of them. And then uh, they um, integrate synaptic input from their neighbors, uh, from the, the, the people they're receiving inputs from. So Sij is the synaptic input. Um, tau is the time constant, the resting membrane potential. And then uh, uh, here's the, uh, um, uh, what the, uh, the, the synaptic input might look like. Um, there's a weight, um, and that's, that's going to be something proportional to the synaptic count that we measure in the connectome. And then there's a nonlinearity here that rectifies this uh, uh, presynaptic voltage. Um, and the idea is that th this is what the synapse is doing. The synapse is uh, uh, taking the presynaptic voltage and releasing neurotransmitter, um, uh, this graded release syn uh, synapse. Um, and uh, the amount of neurotransmitter that's getting released uh, is proportional to uh, some rectification followed by a linear. So this is a threshold linear um, uh, um, uh, function there. OK. Uh, let me see. Here we go. Sorry. Um, OK, so here's where all the magic goes. The weights of the neural network are really uh, where most of the parameters of a neural network are, are, are um, uh, uh, contained. Um, but uh, what we're going to say here is that the connectome gives us much of that. And so uh, this is a little bit nasty, but I'll unpack it. Um, what we get from the connectome is a count. It tells us how many synapses there are between any two neurons. Um, that's neither positive nor negative. It's just a, 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 an integer, or in this case, we've you know, uh, averaged it. So it's the average number. We've uh, uh, multiplied it by a sign, which we get from, some, uh, from uh, knowing which neurotransmitter a particular neuron expresses. And uh, the indices here correspond to the type of that neuron. So Ti and Tj are the type of neuron i and type of neuron j. Um, so uh, we know that uh, neurons of the same type express the same neurotransmitters. So, so, that's, so everything in black we get from the connectome. The connectome tells us um, uh, you know, all of this. But what we don't know is how strong is a single synapse. Um, you know, there's some um, biophysical sort of uh, strength, the amount of current uh, that a single synapse might uh, contribute to. Uh, and, and we don't know what that is. And so that's another free parameter. And that's, that has to do with the dynamics of synapse. Um, so in, yeah. Does sigma depend on TI? Are there violations of Dale's law, or is it just? Um, so it still depends on TI and TJ. Uh, but whether it, it uh, uh, violates Dale's law or not, there is one case where um, we, we think uh, there's a receptor that, 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 that switches the sign. 
Uh, so, uh, so this is all measured from the connectome. And here we have a small number of parameters, which just have to do with the number of types um, that are connected to each other. The number non-zeros in that big matrix, yes. So I just wanted to ask a quick question about f. Uh, yes. So you were saying it's some kind of like a linear threshold function or... Exactly, or threshold linear, yes. Sigmoid or kind of like... So we just uh, chose line. threshold linear here. And the idea is that uh, um, uh, the, there's... Uh, um, these are non-spiking neurons. For non-spiking neurons, there's particular kinds of synapses um, that uh, they're, they're not quantum release. Um, uh, it just means that the amount of neurotransmitter they're releasing generally um, grows as the voltage, as the presynaptic voltage increases. Um, but uh, below a particular threshold, they generally don't release. So they, they're off below a certain threshold. So we're kind of modeling the linear part of that range. So then you actually have two more parameters for each cell type, right? You have where you're going to put the threshold, and you have the slope. So that, those are contained here. The, the F, though, you have these two things. Well, uh, they're, they're, they're kind of, uh, 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 those are degenerate parameters. Right. Because that's, based, that's relating to your input, whereas the resting potential is in the absence of input. Uh, we can talk through it, but it's, it's exactly... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, and, and then and then this parameter over here uh, can play with the scale. So the, the, those are, um, yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so um, so what we have is is, is these parameters, and uh, with the measurements that we have, so this model that we have. Uh, oh yeah, let me just uh, click through all of that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so we, 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 we are now making a simulation of about 40,000 neurons. Um, this is, you know, all of these uh, neurons here. Um, but with the connectomic measurements that we have, we now only have 734 free parameters. And that scales really with the number of cell types, but not the number of cells. Um, and so this is a massive simplification that we get because we've measured the connectome, um, uh, even for this very large network. Are there going to be certain situations where the 700, 734 free parameters is still very daunting for a theorist? Are there going to be reasonable situations where the 734 can get drastically reduced to something we can manage? Um, maybe, but uh, 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 we'll use machine learning. Okay. Yeah. So from my perspective, that's a very small number of parameters because you know, what we're actually going to do is we're going to train those parameters the way we train a deep neural network. I mean, for a mathematician, like, three parameters is already large. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm serious. I'm sorry. It's large. Yes. Actually, some of those are biophysics things that maybe be measured, right? Because you went down the electric geology, like, wasn't the membrane type constant? Yeah. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, no. These are effective parameters that actually integrate across a large number of act, actual microscopic uh, biophysical phenomena. And so it's not clear that uh, you know, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between microscopic measurements and these effective parameters. You would need a much larger model uh, to, to be able to use those, and then there would be a lot more missing uh, parameters. Yes? You constrain the order of magnitude, right? For example, whatever tau should be seconds, right? Um, yes. Yes. Within uh, that range, there's, yeah. So I guess it pertains to Mason's question. Do you yes. have this like type by type matrix of fudge factors? Have you thought at all about trying to squish that down to like a linear number of parameters and cell types by making it like only presynaptic dependent or something yeah. or low rank or something like that? You can, yeah, you can imagine a lot. Um, for instance, the number of neurotransmitters and receptors is going to be smaller than the number of types. And so we could hope. We don't know. All of these things need to be tested. We just don't know the, the, the relevant uh, degrees of complexity yet. I, I would have expected that parameters like the characteristic time constant or the rest potential for a given neuron type would be determined experimentally. Um, it doesn't seem uh, such an arduous as compared to getting the connect of itself. The thing is, those measurements will pertain to things. Those par the parameters that I have actually account for a lot of things. 
There could be synaptic time scales that are being, there could be conduction, there could be, um, you know, uh, a, a bunch of other um, biophysical phenomena that are being all sort of uh, uh, um, lumped into that one parameter. So it's, it's hard to really measure it. Let, 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 let me phrase my bucket list in a slightly, slightly different way. So, you know, it may be that out of those 734, you get some combination of them, and some are much more important than others. And some of them, are things, you know, they're, they're still technically parameters, but things are not as sensitive to them. And if, if one can start with a 734, and, you know, whether it's through machine learning or something else, and say, here are ones that we know are sensitive, here are ones that we know are not sensitive, that would be super helpful. Right. You can do that sometimes if you have some kind of utility function of cost function and you know you're at the minimum because you have optimized and if you look at the second derivative properties, if you get very shallow minima then the value of the parameter can be moved around more and if sure. you have a very sharp minimum then the value of the parameter has to be yeah, known sure. very tightly. Okay. So, but you need an extra piece of information to do that which is what is the circuit doing. Okay. And how can, can we do it well? Yeah. So maybe just to help you continue, maybe we should <laughs> remind ourselves that, you know, when we've been looking at the SDG, when some of these parameters have been measured very accurately, the variance between individual animals can be so big yeah. that maybe the issue of what can you do with 734 is the right way to go rather than to believe the specific experiments. That have been done. Thank you. And I will proceed. <laughs> Good. Um, uh, yes. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say that uh, we know something about what the motion pathways of the fruit flies visual system do. They look for motion. And, and that's a very sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, broad sort of uh, um, uh, 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 guess, hypothesis that one might make, uh, which, you know, um, and so how do we instantiate that? So what we did was we said, somewhere in this network, it should be detecting motion. We don't know where, but somewhere. And uh, what does it mean to detect motion? Well, we have these computer vision data sets where people have video clips. And for these video clips, people know um, uh, where each pixel moves from one frame to the next. So that's called optic flow. It's a classic computer vision task that people have trained artificial neural networks on forever. And so we just downloaded that data set. Um, and we asked if uh, we could train this fruit fly connectome to perform that task. And the hypothesis being that whatever those biophysical parameters are, you know, they should probably, if, if you know, we can find ones that are good for solving this task, you know, let's see if that gives us accurate predictions of neural activity. Um, and so here's what that looks like. Here's a video clip. These are different frames. We kind of render them onto the fly eye. And then uh, here's what we want at the end of the day to be able to decode from the network. So, so somewhere in here, it's going to compute motion. Um, it's going to compute it in the fly's coordinate system of motion. We don't know what that is. The biology might use a different uh, representation of motion than the computer vision scientist does. Um, and so then we have a little decoder that translates, does the coordinate transformation, uh, to the computer vision representation, which looks like this, where for each um, uh, frame, there's a vector field. Uh, so each pixel has a vector, and that vector uh, tells you which, where that pixel is going to move to in the next frame um, uh, in, in, in this video clip. And so we train the whole thing end to end using backpropagation through time. So this is a set of uh, 45,000 ordinary differential equations. Uh, coupled through the weights, um, and we integrate them numerically in time, and then uh, um, uh, we compute derivatives with respect to each of these uh, parameters such that um, this task is solved better. So there's uh, some intuition here that's important to have. Um, what we are doing here is not the same as training a deep neural network. When you construct and train deep neural networks in machine learning, you're trying to do something like this, where you have a blank, you, you can sculpt any function that you want onto it. Uh, these are ge very general purpose function approximators that you, by design, construct that can represent any function, and then you use learning to imprint that function onto it. 
Um, and so you want highly flexible sort of uh, function approximators there. We're not doing that. We're doing something more like archaeology where the weights have already been, you know, they're already in the connectome. And so we don't really want to change the function that the original connectome was trying to compute. We want to just uncover it. And so we're trying to find these biophysical parameters that will, um, you know, our, our model, changing those biophysical parameters um, can't um, really dramatically change the space of um, possible functions that can be computed by that circuit. Um, but we're trying to narrow down which of those possibilities uh, is consistent with the computation of optic flow. So we're intersecting these two constraints that, that uh, you know, we have this, these connectome uh, measurements for the weight, uh, but also that the network as a whole compute the function that we think the circuit might be performing. So, you know, connectome plus some guess about the biophysics plus this task optimization, will that give us neural activity predictions? So here's what we did. We um, took this model. Now, this is a mechanistic simulation. So we can simulate any experiment that somebody can do in the lab. We can simulate uh, um, uh, the same visual stimuli that uh, people have used in the lab. We can stimulate, uh, simulate silencing. We can simulate, you know, a, a lot of these perturbations. Um, and so we asked for the laboratory stimuli that were presented um, and characterized where people measured the neural activity. How well can we predict on a single neuron by single neuron basis um, that those measures? Yes. This, is, this task of predicting the neural activity comes after the training. Exactly okay. right. Exactly right. So um, here's uh, one example of that. What you can do, these are, um, so each of these is a special neuron that, um, you know, people have spent a lot of time studying. Um, and, uh, you know, um, each of these uh, making a measurement uh, might have been like one paper. Um, and so we've actually um, accumulated uh, the evidence that uh, for that system across 26 studies um, and characterized um, over, um, you know, what the collective sort of our understanding of the field is. Um, and, uh, you know, different labs use different stimuli. And so there's various sort of subtle differences um, uh, from paper to paper, which um, aren't perfectly sort of. So uh, a type of analysis that we did was ask about, uh, um, you know, um, at a broad scale, um, there's all sensory systems have the segregation into on and off pathways. So on neurons are neurons where if you flash a single photoreceptor or a single pixel, um, and you can flash it by increasing the light or decreasing the light. Um, so the blue, the dark blue are, are where you increase, and the light blue are where you decrease, light decrements. Um, how does that neuron respond? So on neurons are neurons that respond um, in the same direction. So if you increase, they also increase their activity. Off neurons are neurons that turn off in response to increases in the stimulus strain. And so this is something you see across sensory systems. And this has been well characterized in this um, uh, amongst you know, many of these neurons. Um, and so we're, we've kind of, kind of color coded these according to that. And so we've um, uh, uh, simulated all of these experiments. Different labs use different durations. And so their, their you know, flash durations change, everything changes. So we've kind of plotted everything. Um, and for these neurons that I'm showing you here, we get all of these right except for uh, this one over here, um, where, where, where our prediction is, is inverted. But even that, because of this biphasic response, you know, it could be that people are looking at uh, calcium versus voltage. All of these are voltage predictions. Um, but uh, you know, there can be differences in what someone might measure uh, relative to what's actually happening to the voltage, because we don't measure that. So these voltage time courses are very different from cell to cell. Are you paying attention to that as yes. well? Yes, and that also matters. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, we actually correctly predict the biphasic responses that are seen in some of these. Um, so qualitatively, we do a pretty good job um, at the scale. And uh, um, I, can, I can kind of show you a bit more. This is the one in this particular uh, class of models. Doesn't work right, but I'll actually show you that um, there's a bigger ensemble here where you can get the right answer um, uh, more robustly um, in, in, in a bit. Now, um, in 2013, there was this discovery of um, elementary motion detectors um, 
showing that these uh, two classes of neurons, T4 uh, and T5, are neurons that first are the first neurons in the system that are motion sensitive. Um, and uh, they come in four flavors, which are selective to motion in four different directions. And so if you take something like an edge and you move it in you know, these eight different directions, you can ask, does a neuron respond more strongly in one direction versus the other? Um, and uh, um, our model correctly predicts which neurons are, might be predict, uh, more strongly selective to bright edges moving on a dark background versus dark edges moving on a bright background, uh, and the four directions in which they're. So this is experiment, and these are predictions for both of these. Um, and, and, and really, that's a summary. This is a summary um, after you kind of do some analysis. But the actual predictions look like this. This is just a voltage trace when you take an edge and you move it from you know, in one direction versus in the opposite direction for one of these neurons. This is T4C uh, that, that I'm showing. And here's the stronger response in the preferred direction than in the null direction, which is kind of the opposite direction. And the cool thing that you can do with our model that's harder to experiment is to sort of dig down mechanistically and figure out what's going on underlying, um, underlying this response. You can ask, you know, what are the excitatory inputs doing? What are the inhibitory inputs doing for one direction versus the other? This is something that's been um, the topic of a, a, a lot of experimental work. Um, and so this is something that, that, that we can actually um, uh, address with, with, with modeling, with mechanistic models of this sort. We can even dig down further and ask, you know, which uh, of the, so these are all the main input cell types to this uh, T4 neuron. And we can ask, you know, how do those change as you look at the preferred direction versus the null direction? Um, which ones might be, you know, having the bigger impact um, uh, on the, the functioning of that, of that neuron? Uh, these are sort of model-driven uh, predictions. All of this came from a model that has never been trained on any uh, information from a living brain. So this all coming from uh, predictions from, uh, uh, you know, uh, data from a dead brain. Okay, so what we actually did, which I didn't tell you, is that I didn't just train one model, we trained 50 models. And that's because with these constraints, that still doesn't give you a unique solution. There's actually a space of solutions, and you expect there to be a space of solutions, not just one solution. And so the question now you can ask is, what does that space of solutions look like? And you know, really, this is where the discovery engine is. So you could imagine that you take your uh, connectome, which we now have comprehensive measurements for, and you can take uh, um, uh, you know, these other constraints that we might have, um, uh, other measurements that have been made in the system, the behavior of the animal, neural activity measurements, silencing studies, and you can layer them all on to this um, uh, common model using machine learning and this sort of task optimization way. And then you can ask, what are all the different ways in which the circuit can solve those tasks or behaviors um, and study them? And th that's where you can now do um, hypothesis testing in, in a targeted way using experiments. Um, uh, so, um, so here's um, one way that we've looked at that, those 50 models. Um, in this case, uh, I'm showing you the best 20% uh, of those models um, according to how well they solved that task. And uh, so each of these um, here is one of those uh, 64 cell types. And actually, you can see you know, how much has been characterized over 20 years of study, experimental study. It's still you know, only a small fraction of the entire optic lobe um, has been experimentally characterized. So the measurements of experimental you know, living, uh, uh, of neural activity in the living brain are uh, sparse. And so you, know, you have to uh, uh, live with that. And so uh, these are all known to be unselective. These are all known to be off-selective. We've characterized um, uh, across these 50 models, or, or the top 10, 20% of them. Uh, and you know, the median predictions is always right, including for that one um, TM4 uh, neuron that uh, uh, was, was uh, uh, off um, in that one model that I showed you. So these are very robust predictions here. Um, and we have predictions for all of these other neurons. Uh, which have never been characterized before, which only come from this sort of um, uh, process. Similarly, you can ask uh, for uh, motion selectivity. So you can be selective to motion in dark edges or bright edges. And you know, we recover the well-known motion selectivity of T4 and T5. 
We also recover that none of these other neurons are motion selective and they're not supposed to be. Um, and, and we have a few new sort of novel predictions as well. So could you go back? Yes. So in this case, to go back to Alad's question from earlier, is it STG-like in the sense that there's compensatory things? When this is up, that's down. So it's not, in a way, this is kind of not producing quite the picture that uh, is, is in the ensemble, right? Like there's, they don't all go fluctuate and they kind of have a particular pattern. I'll show you that. That's a really good question. And it's the next slide. Um, so, uh, so what you can do is you can actually ask, you know, in a in in a more unbiased way, what's the space? What's the solution space look like? So I can take all fifty models, and um, I can take a single cell type, and I look at the response of that um, single neuron um, across fifty models to the same large panel of stimuli. So that's a complete characterization of its response space. And I can cluster those responses and ask, you know, are these 50 solutions or are they, you know, really, you know, smaller cluster of solutions? And it turns out for T4C, there's three solutions here. And uh, I've uh, color coded them based on the quality of that model at solving the task. So how well can it compute motion? And it turns out that uh, um, the best model cluster actually has the correct tuning um, direction selectivity. And so those are these circles. And they also have the lowest, the best error. So the best uh, 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 performance of performing the task. Um, the second best cluster actually also has direction selectivity, but in the opposite direction. And that was interesting to us. And then there's the worst cluster, which is kind of, you know, got a, 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 a you know, bag of sort of uh, mixed responses. Uh, and that's also the cluster of models that performs poorly on the task. And so that's why when I told you we only looked at the top 20%, uh, this is why we did that. OK, so there was something interesting going on here, uh, because these are two different hypotheses, which um, you know, are not too far off in, in, in performance. And they both um, have direction selectivity, but uh, in opposite direction. So we dug down a bit more. And then we looked at the inputs to those neurons. And so these are the predominant inputs. And we looked at their. Uh, on-off selectivity of those neurons. And so we found that there was an interesting correlation there between the clusters um, of the T4 uh, response properties and the clusters of their inputs. Um, and, and in particular, um, the correct direction selectivity response cluster also included the correct predictions for the input neurons uh, for their on and off selectivity. Whereas the, um, the cluster that had the wrong direction null tuning had wrong um, on-off selectivity for the input neurons. So these clusters are correlated in exactly the way that, you're, uh, that, you're, that Vivek was saying. And, uh, um, and what this also means is that, let's say now for the very first time, we made a measurement in a living animal. You know, I would say, well, let's make a measurement in T4C because if you measure that one neuron, it actually constrains the parameters of these input neurons as well as the other um, uh, uh, um, uh, T4 cell types as well. And so because we have this connectome and because we have this model, we now can see the tight correlations in the hypothesis space and can rule out many of them uh, with targeted sort of experiments. Uh, there's more predictions that you can make with this. These are very classical sort of. Uh, figuring out what might be the optimal stimulus. This is the kind of thing that people have done. Uh, and so we can continue to do those th kinds of things. Uh, quick question. Yes. You did the, the UMAP thing on the space of the matrices of fudge factors, the yes. alphas, I think you call them. Do you get similar clusters instead of on these response profiles? Say that one more time. UMAP on what? The, the matrix of alphas for the different fitted numbers. Oh. I'm just curious about the cluster in the space of parameters versus... That's a good question. We haven't compared those. There is a large distribution of, in the parameter space also. We haven't correlated them. That's a good, that's a good question. Yeah. Hello. Just to clarify, maybe you said it and I missed it, but in terms of the amount of 50 models that you trained, I mean, you have numbers for the errors, which were a little hard for me to interpret what yeah. they mean. In a sense of how, you know, would any of these, the low-performing ones would still pass 
as you know sensible ones, or these are really you know that you where you started from in the training would get you to a local minima that really sucks. That's a good question. We haven't qualitatively looked at them. I will say qualitatively, even the best ones, you know, from a computer vision perspective, you'd say, eh, not so good. The fruit fly uh, isn't a good match to this particular data set. And this particular data set, I think, is hard to do well on with a fly eye, which has low resolution. So we didn't do a good job on that, selecting a good task, I think. Sandra. But <clears throat> related, to, oh, sorry. related to this, if you were to um, train the model in a constrained fashion, so no connectome information, how well you would uh, perform? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so um, we, uh, gosh, I've forgotten the number. Um, so, we, yeah, 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 yeah. So I think we get 60% uh, of the way relative to that. So we have, we have those bounds. Uh, yeah, exactly. Good. That's a good question. Um, okay, so um, this is actually recapitulating something that uh, uh, Ashok showed um, uh, a couple of days ago. And uh, so we did a similar experiment where we had the teacher student sort of thing to ask when does this sort of procedure work? And, and our hypothesis was, uh, so let's say that you have this network, it's trained to perform MNIST. Here's a network that you, you make connectomic predictions and you ask, you know, how well can I build a model of it? Um, the reason why I want to show you this again is because we were kind of looking at a different axis, which I think you've looked at as well. And this is a sparsity of the connectivity. Um, and uh, um, what we found is that if the network is really sparsely connected and you know the connectome, then you can do a better job aligning the activities of the hidden units when you train um, these, uh, both of these networks to perform the same task, but you also share the connectivity. Now that, there's a, um, a, 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 an interesting detail there. So let's say that you know whether or not a, a, a pair of neurons is connected, but not how strongly they're connected. And this is something Gwyneth uh, uh, was, was, was asking about earlier. Um, then if, they're, um, if it's a densely connected network, then really the con knowing that they're connected doesn't give you a lot of information. Um, and so that doesn't really help you very well. And so the correlation of the responses, how well you can predict the neural activity, is pretty poor. But if the network is sparsely connected, and actually all of the networks that we are looking at in biology are usually around here, then you can actually do a pretty good job, even if you don't know how, strongly, um, each, uh, um, how strong each connection is, if you just know it. But actually, in reality, we're close to here, because we know something about how strongly these, these neurons are connected through the synapse counts. And then, you know, across the range of, of sparsity, um, you know, the, you don't necessarily need to rely on sparse connectivity as a coach. So um, this is our hypothesis for why, you know, this and when this sort of system, uh, this way of sort of bringing together the connectome and task constraints can help. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there could be other uh, mechanisms as well. So, so what I hope I've shown you is if you have measurements at this bottom scale, but you combine it with measurements or a hypothesis at the top scale, at the macroscopic level uh, of how the collective dynamics of the network sort of function together, those two scales can then sort of bridge this gap and, and intersect. The intersection of these constraints actually is quite powerful in uh, constraining the space of neural activity patterns and mechanisms of neural computation. Um, and so this kind of uh, tells you that this connectivity, measurement of connectivity is somehow very special. You know, it doesn't change as um, on the same time scale as neural activity. So it's much more stable. And you can measure it pretty comprehensively in a dead brain. You don't need a living animal for that. And so if you can get that and you can combine it with um, other macroscopic measurements, not necessarily neural activity, but maybe behavior, uh, then maybe the, the, there's a far you can go. Um, and so um, maybe with one minute, I can just summarize. Um, and I think the, the pitch that I'd like to make for us as a community 
is that this brain is really small by deep learning standards. And so if you think about the amount of data that you might need to constrain it, just in terms of bits, I mean, not all data is the same. But if we just think about the, the amount of data, um, it may not be that, that big that we need to constrain the small number of parameters that are left over after we've already measured the connectome. So given that we already know the connectome, we already know how many neurons there are, these remaining biophysical parameters that, that we have um, are not that many. Um, and they probably scale with the number of cell types rather than the number of cells. And the number of types we now heard is, you know, on the order of um, uh, maybe 10,000, let's say. Um, and so that's uh, um, sm much smaller than uh, the, uh, the number of neurons even, and much, much smaller than the size of a deep neural network. And there is a large amount of data that we can bring to bear already. There's, <coughs> uh, you know, the connectome, there's some neural activity, uh, there's a lot of behavior. We can get lots and lots of behavior. And so the thing that we've now done is to also build a biomechanical um, body model that we can use to embody this uh, nervous system and uh, um, uh, connect the nervous system to behavior. And this has worked with Gwyneth and uh, um, a few other colleagues at Genelia and Google DeepMind. And if you want to hear about it, you can ask me a question. So thank you. <laughs>